as my grandfather, what is the number one thing? Patience. Patience with intentionality, delayed gratification, and a lifestyle change. It actually, you know this, you see it every day. I don't I only know how many people that you've saved their lives by them just changing their lifestyle, changing the perceptions, changing the perspective. Quit validating the deceptions as far as the informational deception and basically the authoritative deceptions that got us here with the cholesterol lies, the fat-free fiction, everything that you know that we know that we battle. If your intentionality is to help save children's lives, we have a generation to save. We've uh, sold them short. They haven't had the break that we had growing up, so we're going to give it back to them. Well, hello there. Slim, how you doing, man? Hey Sean, good to see you, man. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Where you you're looking, you're looking nice and slim. Good for you. Looking like you're in good shape there. So, hey, I have to watch you, man. I have to see what you're doing. <laughs> well, uh, we wanted to talk. I think we want to talk about a little bit about this Texas Beef Initiative. So, you know, well, first of all, uh, just for people who don't remember you or don't, you know, we did an interview back about a year ago, I think, something like that. Yeah, might remind about, us a little bit about now. remind us a little bit about your background. Well, you know, about three years ago, I, I dove into food intelligence. I had a big old health scare. And so I started looking at our food and, you know, where I come from, agriculture and, and ranching, you know, I, I went back to the source of where I came from and uh, never really had to really pay attention to nutrition and stuff because of the way I was raised. But with that health scare, what I did is I started uncovering a lot of things, right? And uh, we know what's going on with the industrial food complex, you know, what we're trapped in as far as the highly processed foods, you know, the poisons in which we have. And that's when I decided to go ahead and get back to my roots and start something called the Beef Initiative. I started out as the Texas Beef Initiative, mm. but now it's the Beef Initiative because I grew up with a freezer full of beef and it, it, it gave me a lot of strength gave me a lot of a community from where I came from. And I said, well, I'm going to expand this out in my community, then across the state of Texas. Now it's across the nation and now we're going global. So it has expanded that fast. It's been about a year. I think whenever you and I first spoke, I think I had about three ranchers in my index. Now we're about over a hundred and those ranchers are coming in voluntarily and it's really picking up steam and you know it's amazing the type of communities that we're building the market access that people do not know that they do not have is basically the general awareness that we're spreading across this nation that we've been stolen that market access to good dense nutritional animal protein yeah, I mean, I'm certainly on board with, you know, animal protein being being high quality nutrition. I think it's the best nutrition you can have. And so talk, I guess maybe if you can just give us give us some more of an overview of what this beef initiative actually is. What are you tr trying to accomplish here? Well, what what one thing it is, it's about relationship building. I think it's the most important thing in our society right now is to build solid relationships based around health and nutrition. The other thing it is, it's, it's about knowing how to basically source food. People think that the food comes from the supermarket, you know, and re-educating people of where we came from. I always say you need to start looking back over your shoulder and start living like your grandparents or your great-grandparents did and understand how they built community based around food and start that with yourself, the individual, and then spread that around your local community so you can actually get back to our roots because the health of a nation has been hijacked over the last, let's say, 50 to 60 years. People don't know why that has happened. They're very trustworthy. They want to be intentional about their consumption models. Consumption models being audio, video, and our food, of course. Well, each one of those, if you're not paying attention, they're very centralized and they're controlled by uh, major global apparatuses that a lot of people are not aware of. The Beef Initiative is kind of a communications apparatus. It's a it's a funnel into market access. If you are living somewhere like in, say, New York City, and you can't find what I'm talking about, you can go to the Beef Initiative right now, and we are shipping across the United States the best animal protein in the world. We have the amount of ranchers. We have the volume. You know, we, we compete with people like ButcherBox now. And right now, moving forward in 2023, is we're going to be announcing that you don't have to shop at the supermarket anymore. If you want the best beef in the world, you're going to come to the Beef Initiative. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess you know, if if your vision plays out to 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 the extent that you you hope it does, what what would that look like? I mean, what what would the sort of American or I guess worldwide consumer uh, selection be? What what kind of how would they look for them? You bet. The one thing that I reflect on a lot is Texas, because Texas has a huge beef industry. We once fed a nation, you know, the Texas cattle drive really started the beef industry in the United States. And if you look at Texas history, and especially like whenever I was coming up, you know, I was born in the late 60s, probably like you were. You were probably born about 67, something like that, 68. Uh, You know, in the state of Texas, we had over uh, we had one processing facility in each county across the state of Texas. That's 254 processing centers. Now, on a multinational scale, we have four global multinational companies processing all of our animal protein, 80% of it. So if you look at the big picture, what we wanna do, because we are now consulting on opening up processing uh, centers, we have two microprocessing centers that we use in the beef initiative now that are not controlled by the multinationals. So what I'd like to see as far as the beef initiative is that we continue to consult on the processing centers to decentralize that control and that apparatus that has basically hijacked our nutrition. You know, and for people to understand, we are going through a nutritional starvation in this nation. And so if you look at it like that, what I'd like to do, it's not everybody always talks about scalability. You know, uh, Joe Rogan and Will Harris were on the other day on a podcast and I keep on hearing Joe Rogan saying, how do you scale this? How do you scale? We're not trying to scale anything. We're trying to replicate the success of what the Beef Initiative has accomplished. And that's actually getting market access to people in their communities, if not their communities within their states. So if you want to look at next year at this time, I think that basically having more people across this nation that are intentional about sourcing their food in more of a peer-to-peer transactional system that we're going to expand this out and replicate across the United States. Uh, I had four conventions this year across the United States. We had one in Texas. We had one in Colorado. We had one out at Will Harris's place at White Oak Pastures. We had one down in uh, south of Austin. We're about to have one in Nashville. What we're doing is we're building these little nodes of people, communities that are replicating across the United States where people don't have to fight to get that beef, to get the best pure animal protein in the world. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep on moving forward with that. Yeah, I think one of the big bottlenecks is is the processing, access to processors. I know a lot of people are a year out. You know, they've got to project where they're going a year out. And so what kind of hurdles? I mean, when you say microprocessing, what does that mean? I mean, I know there's some of these big processing facilities that can do 5,000 head a day or something like that. What, are, what do you right. mean by micro? How many how many animals can you run through? How many do you, what do you project you need? And, and what are the hurdles? Because can you ship across state lines? You know, there's there's the whole issue sure. with USDA uh, requirements. Talk, talk a little bit about the processing side of it some more. Yeah, you know, it's different for each state, but I'll give Texas an example. We kind of lead as far as, you know, examples and how, you know, uh, roadmaps and protocols. What you have, you have USDA certified and you have like in the state of Texas, you have Texas certified. If you're Texas certified, you can you can sell within your state and you can sell around the border states, but you can't sell, you know, across the nation. Once you have a USDA certification, you can cross those borders. Okay, if you're a processing center, we have both of those types in the beef initiative that we're using right now. One's called Panhandle Meats. It's in the Texas Panhandle. We just had hometown meats uh, in Luling, Texas. Mm-hmm. Hometown Meats is USDA. That is Cole Bolton with KNC Cattle. He is our number one supplier. That's all the beef that we're shipping right now through the uh, through the beef initiative. That's why we can and we are shipping over to over 48 states. Um, whenever you look at the size, you, you brought up the multinationals. What they do is they kill between three to 5,000 head a day. And they process that beef, and then they control that distribution of that beef. Most of that beef is going overseas to the highest bidders. The beef that usually we're consuming, if you're coming to Kroger or Costco or Walmart or any of these major supply chains as far as supermarkets, I call it the Brazilian cattle drive. We are actually eating foreign beef, but we think that we're eating U.S. beef. 
that is controlled by those multinational processing and distribution packer centers. A lot of the United States doesn't realize how far we've been captured as far as these multinational processing centers. And so what we do, and I say micro, Panhandle Meats in uh, in the Panhandle of Texas, we're doing about 30 head a, uh, a week. 30 head a week is, is about a 30-mile radius around the Texas Panhandle. You, uh, hometown Meats down in Luling, Texas, well, he's doing 250 a week where we can ship across the United States, you know, that many cattle. The scalability, uh, scaling down is what we're achieving. That has been the biggest bottleneck right there because people think that we have to have these big processing centers to supply us. We don't. We need to go back to where we did have microprocessing centers in regions and counties across the United States. And I think that a lot of people are starting to understand that and more microprocessing centers are opening up in the state of Texas and that is scaling out across the United States as well. So two points. I mean, you said that, you know, our beef industry has been captured by, by Brazilian, Brazilian corporate interest more or less, because, you know, my understanding is we don't actually import much beef from Brazil. Most of we, most of our imports are Canada, Mexico, New Zealand, Australia would be the top four imports. We yeah. get very little from Brazil, but the companies that control a large per sector of the United States beef industry are Brazilian JBS and, and National Beef from Marfrig. Is is that fair to say? I mean, and you might see more with hamburger where they mix the they mix and beef from right. four different sources or something like that, right? Yeah, it, it is Brazilian. Sometimes you're going to get a mixture. You know, they did a they did a study on some uh, burger down there south of San Antonio and one of the multinationals had over 89 genetics of 89 different cows, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's that was in one pound of hamburger meat. And so you do get a lot of import from Australia, you know, from these other countries, like you say. And a lot of times that meat is combined with other meat from different nations. And so, you know, by saying that, you know, whenever our, we still produce the best beef in the world, mm -hmm. United yeah. States does, but our communities, you know, we always say we have to feed the world. Well, we might have fed the world, but we quit feeding our people in our communities because the best be like a, right now I'm standing in the Panhandle of Texas outside of Amarillo, Texas. We got JBS, National Cargill. We've got all the processing centers here. We don't see any of that beef. It all gets shipped away. Yeah. And, you know, that's what we have to reverse as far as awareness first. And through these microprocessing centers, we're not, we're never going to fight the multinational processing centers. That's not what we're doing here. We're saying we're, our intentionality is to go back to our community based programs that we can access our food in a 30 mile radius or, you know, if it has to be in a county or across a region. We want to achieve that. Yeah, there's, uh, I guess some people would say that the reason you have these giant processing facilities is economies of scale, you know, because if you're, you know, you've got right. a startup cost, you've got a production cost, you've got a facility cost, and the smaller ones, you know, you, it's, it's just going to be relatively more expensive for the for the output. Is there any concern about scaling this? And then, and then Stephen's asking about um USDA has allocated some new processing facilities, kind of medium-sized processing facilities. Is that anything that's on your radar or part of this initiative? Well, <laughs> you know, they did allocate, I think it was like a billion dollars to processing centers in the United States on these, uh, they say micro, they're really not micro. What we've seen is a lot of that money gets allocated to, you know, basically the, the the multinationals anyways, you know, the people that get a lot of this money. I haven't seen a lot of the smaller producer processors actually receive any of that government money. We're staying away from it. We don't we don't want to actually be, you know, dependent upon it in any of the processors, ranchers, producers. We don't even look at that. As far as scalability, once again, we're not trying to scale anything. We're trying to replicate successes. We're trying to replicate where we came from. And in the state of Texas right now, we have 200 microprocessing centers that are mothballed because of the scaling up of the multinational processing centers. We're just reversing course and we're doing it on the micro level, on a regional level, on the community level. That's what people need to understand as far as their perception and, and the perspective of what we're up against. It's not an instant gratification type of game. You know, we have a lot of producers that are coming through the beef initiative right now, Holy Cow Beef out of Lubbock, Texas. 
they developed the protocol to sell grass-fed beef through Whole Foods along with Will Harris. And of course, you have like Hearst Ranch out in California. So you have a lot of ranchers, producers that have already stewarded market access in a certain way, but now we're just streamlining it down to where you can have market access. And now that we have distribution through processing centers that we control, we can replicate that and we can scale the delivery of that beef across the nation. Yeah, I mean, one of the issues you're always going to run into, and this is where the companies like JBS and their retail system is price. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, people are still limited by what they can what they can afford to pay. Are you going to be? Is there a goal to be price competitive with some of these bigger places eventually? We already are. Um, through, if you look at uh, in the beef industry right now, the one thing that we're fighting right now is shipping, of course. But they, we've already cut our shipping in half. And if you look and you you can change your consumption model to more. Uh, uh, you know, meat based, beef based through somebody that is a peer to peer transaction, like through the beef initiative. If you look at the quality of your food and everybody needs to once again, put this into perspective, what is, what is expensive? Is it expensive to eat highly processed food and to eliminate nutritional protein out of your diet? Or is it basically more cost affordable to go ahead and change your consumption model into the best beef in the world to where you're not, your insurance costs go down, your health improves, you're not spending so much money on these highly processed foods. So as far as your consumption model and your pocketbook, we are already competing with, uh, uh, let's say, a pound of ground beef. It's just as the, it's the same price through the beef initiative as it is at Kroger or it is at Walmart. And then, OK, let's look at what are we comparing? Are we comparing the same quality to quality? No, our quality of beef. And you know this, you eat the best beef in the world across, you know, everywhere you go, you're eating the best beef there is. There is no comparison as far as quality. And right now we are price competitive because the multinationals, you know, JBS just got uh, settled out of court this last year for $56 million for price manipulation during COVID. They can up the price. They can inflate the price anytime they want. They made $500 million of profit during that time. They settled out of court for $56 million. How are you going to be dependent on a multinational comp uh, company that basically manipulates that price to where you, it turns into caviar through the supermarket? Right now, our beef is cost effective, it's cost affordable, and it's basically in line with the supermarket right now, which are the, the prices are being set by those multinationals. Yeah, there, uh, you know, and you mentioned because I got a $56 million slap on the wrist and made $500 million on that. So it's, it's a cost of doing business. It's, it's not going to dissuade them from continuing to do that. We see the same no. thing with the pharmaceutical industries. They get a billion dollar fine, but they made a hundred billion dollars like a cost of doing business. Um, what you mentioned, it was a Texas beef initiative. Now it's a beef initiative. The goal is national and then global. What is it? What are, what are, are there any states that are like, is, do you, are you finding that some states are more amenable to this or is it, is it pretty easy in every state? Yeah, there's every state is going to have their own rules and regulations. You know, and you look at the cattle industry and you look at the geography, you look at the demographics, you look at market access, the distribution. There's so much that goes into play within the beef industry itself. You know, Texas, all the way through the Midwest, Kansas, Nebraska, and everything is going to be different than what you have out in California or maybe even Louisiana, Arkansas. But what I found out is with our model of being regenerative based, it's really about the same across this nation. There's tons of producers out there that do not have that voice. The ranchers out there, what the Beef Initiative is really doing and moving forward very powerfully is we're giving those ranchers a voice again. And by doing that, I think the biggest thing that people always are looking for are these solutions and answers. Well, the solutions and the answers are everybody right here on this podcast. We have to change our consumer demand. That is by education and understanding that there is market access to these ranchers across the nation. Some of these states are going to have more restrictive processing rules. We do see that, yes. But once again, Texas is leading the way within processing. You go up to Wyoming, Montana, you know, some states that are big in hunting, you're going to have a little bit more liberal uh, laws that are basically give you better access to that. You know, it, it, you have mobile processing centers, you have mid-level, you have butcheries. And what that requires to understand right here and right now is we, the consumer, have to change the consumer demand. We have to start with education and knowing where food comes from 
And we have to give those people out there, those ranchers that have basically been, um, you know, they've been restricted as far as having a digital voice or a voice in their communities. We have to take action. We, the consumer, can't be complacent anymore because that's what got us here. That's what really complacency with the desire of all this convenience around food is why we're in this nutritional starvation in this health epidemic that we're facing right now. We have to put our foot down. We have to say no more. And then, you know, that's what the Beef Initiative is about. It's about a call to action. It's about taking intentional action to find out how you can build your community, that being your community, being yourself, the individual, your family, or everybody around you in your town, your city, or your county. Yeah, I certainly agree with the nutritional side. I mean, it's 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 shocking, and I just you know, I, I, we just got through an election, and some people are happy, some people are unhappy about the results. But what I just like to say is that you vote every day with your pocketbook. You vote for who you want to be rich. Mm -hmm. You vote for who you want to be powerful by what you consume by what you what you put into your body and that's that's literally a vote you cast every single day and so this is something how you can you can definitely change things um so let me ask you this because you know some people say hey I, i'm feeling like i don't know i'm feeling like a, a you know i want to i want a prime rib for dinner tonight i know i can go to the store dry down wherever and i can buy one or i can buy a set of ribeyes and, and you know it's sometimes spur of the moment how are you going to how do you deal with that? I mean, I mean, obviously, if you got it stocked in your freezer, but let's say you run out. I ran out of ribeyes. I got nothing in my freezer, and I'm feeling like that. How do I? How does a Texas Beef Initiative or the Beef Initiative deal with that? I guess you got a plan ahead of time, or what's what's the thought on that? Well, and, and that is a good question. Once again, we're shifting right here. We're shifting trains of thought. We're shifting our behaviors. We're shifting our lifestyles. I tell everybody out there. I said the Beef Initiative is international lifestyle that you don't understand yet. And what we do is we become more intentional about sourcing our food. We make our food more of a lifestyle based on true nutritional survival instead of a form of convenience where we can go into a drive up and get our fix. Food is a drug now, highly processed foods. We know this. There's a global industrial food shift happening right now that a lot of people do not understand that it's coming our way. They're going to basically put a prohibition against this pure animal protein. So by saying that, if you know that you have market access to something like the Beef Initiative or, or one of the hundred producers, ranchers in the Beef Initiative, then yes, you plan. You don't go out there and just say, hey, I'm going to go get a Big Mac or treat a ribeye like a Big Mac. You treat a ribeye like it's something that is actually very valuable, that's very intentional, and that you actually design your life and your lifestyle around. If that takes a change of behavior, we'll step up. You know, you have all the education out there. You have the market access. You have the means to do this. And I, everybody's busy. You know, everybody, we're not discounting people's lives, especially in these days and times. But I guarantee you, since uh, May, I've driven 33,000 miles across this country, and I've eaten a ribeye every day of my life that I wanted to. So it really is about that intentionality. And it's making that 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 promise with yourself, that sacred promise with yourself. It's like, hey, I'm going to create a legacy within my own family about this is how my family is going to eat for generations to come and establish that trademark within your name and within the belief system of your family and say, this is how we're going to start sourcing food. This was stolen from us. This is how we're going to respect our ancestors. They fought hard for us to have this type of beef in the United States, and we're going to come and we're going to take it back. There's there's a couple comments about the MCOOL, mandatory country, country of origin labeling. I mean, obviously, I assume with the beef initiative, people are going to know where their meat is coming from. One of the concerns is, you know, you buy, buy a pack of hamburger at, 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 at you know Walmart and it says product of the USA when really it means it was processed in the USA and it could have been from Namibia or Mexico right. or whoever, you know, Bolivia, who knows where it's coming from. So thoughts on cool. Is that something you're supportive of? And more importantly, is part of the beef initiative going to be like very clear where the beef is coming from for people that consume it? You bet. Right now, the beef, 100% uh, transparency across the board. I was in part of that comment right there. I was down in Austin, Texas at Central Market. Central Market is owned by HEB. Good supermarket. Good, you know, the Butts family, they have, they do the best they can. But I went into Central Market, bought a $50 ribeye, and it said grass-fed, and it said 
harvested in the United States, USDA prime. So right there to your comment, you don't know where this beef is coming from anymore. The butcher doesn't know it. The supermarket doesn't know it. They get their beef from global beef brokers, and that's all they have control over anymore. So within the beef initiative, we are, like I said, 100% transparency. My goal is to basically make the brand of the Beef Initiative so well known that if you see the Beef Initiative, it's going to be a higher stamp of approval than the USDA. Not something, I'm not breaking any rules. I just want that type of trust, truth, and transparency around our beef because that's who our ranchers are. They are educators. They want to know, they want everyone to know where they come from, how they steward the land, how they steward the animals, how they process the animals, how they don't use any antibiotics, how they don't use any chemicals. And, you know, within labeling laws in the United States right now, the FDA last year won the lawsuit to be able to put 2,000 new chemicals in our food system this year. We don't know what they're putting into our food systems anymore. They can put any label now on any of our food products. We still don't know what's in that food. And if you can accept that that type of stuff is happening and you're not going to participate anymore, then you can look at the beef initiative and say, well, I want to know that rancher. I have market access to be able to shake that rancher's hand. If it's not in person, it's going to be digitally to where you know exactly where that beef is coming from. Um, you, you'd mentioned, um, you know, grass finish. You talked about Will, ha- Will Harris. There's, there's a lot of, you know, interest in regenerative style uh, agriculture. Is this going to be exclusively grass finished beef or is there going to be some uh, for some people, some people actually prefer, you know, uh, you know, grain. No, we're, we're, yeah, that's a good question because I think that, you know, the narrative is, is like, okay, there's only grass fed grass finished beef and that's the only thing you can get. There's a lot of arguments around this and you know, this, mm-hmm. I grew up in commodity cowboy country where I grew up with in a lot of fat, fatty beef. I love it. Uh, a lot of our beef that comes to the beef finish coal with K and C cattle, you know, he grass feeds, but he also finishes off on organic grain where no chemicals, no GMOs, anything like that. So people that want a fatty uh, ribeye or somebody wants it a little bit more lean, you know, that's the difference usually with grass finished and grain finished, organic grain finished, grain that doesn't come from the multinational grain companies or chemical companies. So there's a lot of different protocols within the beef initiative and within the regenerative model that we're going to be able to offer. And you see that all across the nation because it does have a lot to do with geography. State of Texas went through a major drought this year, right? A lot of grass-finished beef didn't have that type of quality that a lot of the consumers wanted. So if you understand that sometimes you might have to shift your taste profile from a grass-finished into an organic grain-finished, then you, the consumer, are going to be a little bit more satisfied. You're going to have a lot more versatility. And you're basically, your, your stack of beef is going to be something that's always there. And I have, a, I have four freezers. They're half- grass finished half organic grain finished yeah i you know let me ask you because i've got a you know i've got two freezers and, and one of them i've got a half you know half a beef that i got locally from one of the, one of the ranchers in town i had it you know process at a local butcher how is that how how is that experience going to be for me be better than if i just did that i mean that that seems like it's, many people say that's a pretty cool thing to do how will the beef initiative improve upon that process uh, what I do, I have four freezers that I keep full. I have four ranchers in my freezers. I joke around with people about, <laughs> and so by having that, I have I have a freezer full of uh, Jason Rick up in uh, Colorado. Rick Ranches. Everybody look him up. He's part of the Beef Initiative, founding member of the Beef Initiative. He's grass finished from Colorado. I have a you know beef in there. I have Holy Cow Beef, you know from Lubbock, Texas. I have Justin Trammell uh, here in the Panhandle. I have Cole Bolton. So I have different ranchers in. And that's how I look at the beef initiative. That type of variety is accessible to everybody within the beef initiative. If you want to buy directly through the beef initiative, go for it. You can go through. There's multiple boxes. We have subscription models between three, four producers now that you can get monthly subscriptions. And so we're giving a lot of different varieties on how you can source your beef. If you see something that you love as far as the beef initiative and what we're offering from our boxes and you're seeing something that you want more, you want to go out there and get a half a cow. Well, you know, a lot of these ranchers will ship a half a cow to you. 
that's a little expensive. Or what you do is you go, like if you're in Wisconsin, you go to Mastodon Farms, Peter Allen. He's in the beef initiative well. You go get a half a cow from Peter Allen. He likes to sell half cows. You go to J- uh, Jason Rick in Colorado. He likes selling a half a beef. You go to Cole Bolton. He likes to sell more of the beef boxes because he has more variety of cuts because he owns his own processing centers. So as to answer the question, is the beef initiative going to be able to give a variety? I think we offer more variety than any basically online merchant out there in the United States right now, because you can go all the way from a full cow, all the way to a half a cow, to a quarter cow, to an eighth a cow, to a variety of boxes, sub- subscription models. So whatever your kind of demand is and whatever best fits your lifestyle or your means, I think you can find it through the beef initiative. Now, I, you mentioned your stack of beef. So that Obviously, in my ears, I hear stacking sats. I hear Bitcoin terminology. I see you've got a Bitcoin sure. thing behind you. I know we the crypto industry in general, and some people say Bitcoin is not crypto. I know there's people that are very distinguished about that. Is that something that yes. – are you guys accepting that type of stuff for this, or how, do, how does that play into that? Yeah, I think back when, you know, a year ago, we were developing our technology stack. And, you know, and you're right. Crypto is not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not crypto. You see all the deception that just went on with FTX in the crypto market. That's basically a bunch of manipulation and, and corruption based around digital currencies. And Bitcoin is not that. Bitcoin is decentralized. It's a store of value. It's a peer-to-peer transactional system that we've built in. We have most of our, a lot of our ranchers have onboarded to be able to accept Bitcoin. What that means is that if I have Bitcoin and my rancher accepts Bitcoin, I can trade beef and Bitcoin, Bitcoin and beef. I don't have to ask permission. We don't have to ask permission from the banks. It's 100% legal. That rancher can actually store some of his value in that Bitcoin, he can transfer it over into fiat and he can actually go out and build his business. What the ranchers that I see right now that love it, they're not having to pay credit card transaction fees anymore. They don't have to pass that along to the consumer anymore. Consumers are happy. The ranchers are happy. And then whenever the rancher does receive that Bitcoin, if he's got $800 in Bitcoin, he goes, I'm going to put 95% of that transaction into fiat and then i'm going to keep five percent as a store of value into bitcoin and then therefore you know you you have a savings account and a store of value that rancher didn't have plus he's not spending that three percent on that transaction fee yeah and that you know like i said i remember when i was uh buying the the side from this guy locally and i said hey can i just do it on my credit card he was like, man, if, can you give me a check or anything? Because they're really, uh-huh. this, it's really the margin is pretty tight on there. So they're doing that. It but really is. Let me ask you because, you know, this is a, this is a, you know, kind of an over broader topic. You know, we've got this, uh, you know, thought that we're going to have this CBDC, centralized bank digital currencies coming in, and that will have complete control. So the banks will have complete control over your money, even what you're allowed to spend it on potentially. That's one of the potential concerns there that they could say, well, you know, you've already exceeded your carbon credit. You're not allowed to buy an extra steak this week or something like that. Mm-hmm. So this is some way to maybe get around that. Is that is that part of the calculation? 100%. There? Yeah. I mean, last year when you and I spoke, COP26 was going on, and they did declare the cow a carbon hazard on an inter- international front. Some you know nations said no. Some said, okay, let's go get a bit busy. The cow is bad. This is coming. It's not going to happen overnight, but we're, we are going to have CBDCs. They are going to give you basically carbon scores. You know, it's more of a social credit score system. And, you know, China's already had massive success. And if you're somebody out there and your consumption model, you know, does uh, entail a lot of beef consumption, you're going to have a lower score when it comes to that digital currency. So you bet. I mean, Bitcoin is property. It is legal. There's nothing wrong with using Bitcoin. It is early in the adoption period. So was the internet. We didn't buy shoes on the internet when it first came out. That's how I came up with startup companies was innovation through the internet. We're in that same pain point with Bitcoin. But what people need to understand is they are going full board and they will turn beef into caviar to most of the people in the United States. It doesn't mean that they're going to get rid of beef. It means that beef is going to be shipped overseas and they're going to introduce another fake protein commodity, which you see every day with all of your, you know, your actions and your education. This is coming and Bitcoin is a way around that. It's decentralized. It's peer-to-peer transactions where we don't get 
a social credit score based on carbon hazards that are nefarious in, in their intent. The cow is not a carbon hazard. The cow ba basically does regrow soil. The, the cow is the best animal protein and the best nutrition in the world. And they're going to put a prohibition against that. And we're not going to have market access if we do follow their rules of centralized digital currencies. Bitcoin is a decentralized currency plus a store of value that's never been seen, you know, in the history of man. And that's what it takes a little bit of education, but we're getting there slowly. They have a 10 year plan. We have a 10 year plan. Yeah. It's so, you know, with some of these CBDs, they could, they could actually change the value of your money based on a social credit score. So if you have a thousand dollars in the bank and they say, well, because you're a, a high consumer of carbon, that thousand dollars is only going to be worth 800 bucks. And if you're a low consumer of carbon, we're going to make that worth $1,200 to incentivize you. And so, that, I mean, th there's all kinds of ways they can, they can manipulate that currency, which is kind of, kind of scary. You know, you got to earn your money. You think it really is. Tomorrow. I mean, what, yeah. it, you know, if you look at it, you know, it's part of the uh, ESG model, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're developing human capital bond markets, you know, hedge funds that are based on consumption models and what you consume. And you look at all the, the major food consolidations that have happened 2017 to 2018 on a global front is when they really took a step forward to the one world food group. They admit it. They say, yes, we're going to have a one world food group. We're going to develop food to where they're going to take the, the soil and the animal out of our consumption models. They'll introduce more fake commodities, just like they've been doing since the early 70s, ever since you and I have been, you know, been alive, you know, from seed oils to high fructose corn syrup to everything that has gotten us here metabolically bankrupt. They're moving full, full speed ahead. And if people are, do not get, like I said before, get more intentional about looking at food as more of a survival mechanism that gives you power instead of a convenience model that is, you know, too easy to get. They have made food so subsidized and commoditized and highly profitable by our consumption, you know, that food has become a drug. It's hard for people to switch off a high processed food. You see this all, you know, you're a doctor, you see this, this is your life. In the amount of people that are coming to me that are scared about this, you know, the, what they're trying to do, but the, also the, the benefits of going through, you know, maybe not even full carnivore, but carnivore, the, the amount of lives that we're saving and that you're saying that, that I receive emails every day saying, thank you. I had no idea of this from the, the plans on the global front of the one world food group, all the way to the health benefits of eating pure, you know, animal protein beef. Yeah, there's no doubt that it is, uh, from a health perspective, it's tremendous. So obviously, like you mentioned, you are swimming against the tide with, you know, so many people trying to condemn animal agriculture in general, particularly cattle. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, you know, reason, you know, obviously these studies are recently coming out saying, you know, all the research on beef being unhealthy is much garbage. It was a lazy science. That study just came out from university of Washington the other day, but you know, mm -hmm. largely it's swept under the rug. Nobody, there's this, there's this sort of narrative that's going to go a certain way, regardless of what the actual facts are. The facts don't really matter. It's all about, uh, you know, driving profit a certain way and, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, I, th I think there's very few small people that are driving that. So how do we fight against that? I mean, as far as, let me ask you this, you know, the beef initiative and where, where do you, where do you see it growing to? How, how are you going to access more ranchers, more states? What's, what's the strategy? What's the five-year strategy on this? Well, one thing to your comment right there, you know, I tell everybody, I look them in the face and I quit, I, I tell them, I said, quit validating the deceptions out there. That's how we fight this. If we don't participate, they have no power. And so we as individuals and we as the citizens of the United States and of the world, we don't have to play their game. And a lot of people need to understand that and be very clear about that. Acceptance is the key. We can empower ourselves as individuals to go out there and build a new beef industry in the United States. And that is spreading across the world. As far as what the beef initiative and, and the really the global look at it, uh, I've got some friends in Australia. You know, they have a huge cattle industry in Australia. A lot of it is commoditized. A lot of it is subsidized. A lot of it is on the global front as well. A lot of it we do consume. By the time it gets to us, it's not the best beef that it could be if it stayed in Australia and it was aged correctly in, you know, the whole protocol of quality beef. 
Well, I'm flying over to Australia at the end of January, and we're going to have probably two major summits and about two to three micro summits. Then I'm going to Thailand. We're going to do it in Thailand. We're going to go across the world, and we're going to broadcast that we're building out locally within the Beef Initiative. Like right here, I'm standing right in the middle of commodity cowboy country. It is the world headquarters of the Beef Initiative. But then this next year in 2023, I'll be going to almost every continent that I can. We're building out locally. We're broadcasting globally. And in whenever uh, we started this podcast, this recording, I said we had probably three producers in the Beef Initiative. We're about 100. I didn't go out there and sell myself. These producers are coming in because they see the value. Every producer that I've ever talked to that have come through the beef initiative, they've increased their herd size, they're selling out of their beef, they actually have a roadmap of success because the consumers are finding them. What we need to understand as consumers is that if we go out there and digitally shake a hand or we basically in person meet somebody in our community, that's how this scales out. Everybody's talking about scale. That's how we replicate and we replicate and re replicate. And I can't yell it loud enough from the mountaintop is each one, as I'm looking on this screen, each one of you is the solution. We need to quit looking so far out as far as these answers. The answers are right here. And in our intentionality, that is the power of the Beef Initiative. We're decentralized. We're not a marketing plan. We're not a mainstream media messaging system. We're nothing that is controlled by mainstream uh, centralized uh, marketing and basically communications. You know, as far as communications, how much do we get censored? How much do, you know, you say, when are people going to be able to have access to the truth that beef is not a hazard to your health? Well, that's based on a lot of things going on right now. Virtue signaling, you know, the idealistic view that, you know, cows are killing our climate and that if you eat this sludge in which they're trying to present to us that you're saving the planet. That's a lot to go go up against, but I think that idealistic behavior is driven by a form of nutritional starvation in a uh, in a form of basically you know idealism that you know you don't have to participate in. You have to educate yourself. It starts with the individual. Yeah, I think poor nutrition makes you make poor decisions for sure. It really does. Um, do you do you? I mean, obviously, you know. The, the, Somebody sitting on the board of JBS is going to like. We don't really like this. I mean, you know, they're they're powerful <laughs> companies. That, you know, they're they're you know multi multi billion dollar companies, sure, uh, hundred billion dollar companies most likely. When JBS is the biggest beef company in the world, are you know are any, any concerns they're going to come out and just say you know we're going to we're going to bribe some senator and make this illegal or something like? I mean, how do you fight against that? Well, you know, within I'll, I'll give you an example here in the Texas Panhandle, we have the Farm and Ranch Freedom Alliance, and they they help uh, they help us. They they are close in with the legislation. Uh, the first of December, I've been asked to uh, go to the U.S. Cattlemen's Association National Convention that is held annually. This year, it is in Nashville. I'm getting involved with a lot of layers of the rules and regulations within the cattle industry itself. And by saying that, sure, you know, somebody on JBS, but the, if you look at the scale, the massive size of what the four multinational processing centers are, we're not a threat to them. We're not. And we're not trying to change anything. We want our politicians and our representatives in our state and national uh, government, we want them to pay attention saying, hey, you guys quit doing this. Our children are dying. You know, we want you to pay attention. We're not trying to put these people out of business. We're not going to talk nefarious against them. They're for profit. They're doing what they are told to do and what they're meant to do. What we want people to understand is you don't have to participate. And all we're doing is giving options, just like going to a different supermarket. We're not breaking in the rules. A lot of times we know the rules and the laws better than the law enforcers know them themselves. There's a form of regulatory capture that has happened within our food distribution and our food production industries. We're bringing that to light. We would sit across the table with anybody. We're not trying to fight or start a war or anything like that. What we want is we want access. We want to build our communities. We want to have sound health. We want to have sound communications. We want to have sound money. We want to have sound food. We're trying to feed our children. Whenever a nation as the United States and 46% of our children right now between the ages of 5 and 11 are obese or overweight, 
And I have, uh, you you know, Dr. Philip Olivadia, he's a friend of ours, uh, Dr. Mary Kerr out of Dallas, Texas. Whenever they have people coming in here, 30-year-old men with heart disease, and he's having to operate for a heart disease on a 32-year-old male that should not have that heart disease. Whenever you have an 11-year-old child coming in with fatty liver disease because of the consumption model of the highly processed food of the industrial food complex, we have a right as citizens to say we're not going to participate anymore. And so that's what I say to anybody that judges us or what our intentions are. We're saving children's lives is what we're doing. Yeah, that's something. I mean, that aspect of it, I think I can't speak more important of how that is. You know, I, I, I earlier this year, I was in San Diego uh, giving a lecture in front of the uh, California Cattlemen's Association. And Colin Woodall, is, who is the CEO of the NCBA, was there. And I literally mm-hmm. spent, you know, half an hour talking to him about the health benefits of beef and, you know, all the things we're doing. And, you know, he told me, I totally get it. I'm on board. This is a message that we need to get out there. And so far, it's been crickets. I mean, it's just been all, you know, lip service. He's not made a single effort from what I can see from, mm-hmm. from these organizations to get out there and say, look, beef as a health food is actually can, can help solve some of these chronic disease uh, epidemics. And I'm just, it's just frustrating to see an organization that who theoretically would benefit from this message and they're not utilizing it. I'm glad to see that you're, you understand the passion I have about let's, let's, let's heal people, uh, yeah. heal our nation, you know, through proper nutrition. And I think, you know, meat is certainly that, um, do you guys have any, I mean, you're, you're, you may be going, you said you're going out to, I, I know, like I just talked with Brooke Miller, who's a, who's a current president of the USCA, U.S. Cattlemen's Association the other day, uh, trying to help, they we're trying to get some research going uh, through uh, looking at autoimmune disease and beef, and they may be helping to secure some beef for the study. But uh, do you enter, I mean, what is your thought on these different organizations that are there? You know, there's tech, I'm sure there's the Texas Cattlemen's Association, there's various states have their individual things. Are you interacting with those other organizations, NCBA, yeah. U.S. Cattlemen's? How's that going? Yeah, Brooke Miller is a great guy. He he reached out to me and said, "Hey, would you come speak in in Nashville, December tenth at the at the convention itself?" And so, you know, you do have these representatives that are reaching out. Uh, Texas Cattlemen's Association. Uh, I brought up Jason Rick of uh, Colorado of Rick Ranches. He's on eight different boards in the state of Colorado. He's a founding member of, you know, the Beef Initiative. There's a lot. I was just up in Idaho and uh, we had a uh, event up there. It was a summit. It was a, it was based around energy, money and agriculture. And we had three or four state representatives that actually just won their elections in Idaho. They're, they're wanting me back in 2023. So there is a lot of people reaching out. And I want, I'm going to say this very firmly. Nobody's going to save us. We have to save ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it starts with education and our intentionality with our consumption models. And when, once again, the consumption models that we need to look at is just not our food, but it's actually the audio and the video content that we allow into our brains. And so if we, as a, us, as a collective, can start really paying attention to the solutions that we are the solution and we don't have to look at these politicians that do, you know, you go out there and speak to them and you shake their hand and then it's crickets. Mm-hmm. I get that every day. You know, 90% of it is a lot of disappointments. But as you know, and I know you power forward with is that intentionality is like, well, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to keep on yelling louder from the mountaintop any which way I have to. But to your point, yes, there's a lot of people paying attention that do have some political control, legislative control from the community based, from counties, cities, all the way to states, and of course, nationally. What um, are you familiar with a guy named Mike Calicrate? Uh, he's out of Kansas, yes. director ranch beef. He's I think he's somewhat similar to you. I, I mean, I'm not sure if I, if I understand the differences. I mean, any thoughts on what he's been doing? In Can- I think he's in Kansas, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe Colorado. Yeah, I believe he is in Kansas. Yeah, yeah I believe it's Kansas, Colorado. He's right there on the border, I think, mm-hmm. of Colorado and Kansas, you know, that western, yeah. eastern part of that border. Um, I've never spoken with Mike, but a lot of my ranchers within the Beef Initiative do know him. Um, you know, he's doing great things. That's what a lot of things that um, I've always known this within the ranching community. You have your commodity cowboys, you have a regenerative, you have your hippie, you know, cattle ranchers, you got your grass farmers, you got all kinds of different, you know, as far as characters and basically protocols of raising beef. One thing that the Beef Initiative really wants people and to clarify this is not a competition. 
anybody that's trying to feed their community and, and save children's lives and grow the best beef that we can, that we actually showed the world that we can, then, you know, there is no competition in anybody within the ranching community that maybe is looking for a different way out. A lot of times the ranchers are stuck in that basically bottleneck of the multinational processing centers. We're like down south with a uh, Cole Bolton and hometown meats and KNC cattle. He's getting more and more producers that are shifting the protocol into more of a regenerative form that they can now process their beef. Now they can actually offer their beef to the consumers through the beef initiative. That's where we're going with this. I think Calitrix is doing the same thing. You know, he's trying to expand awareness, education, and give that market access that has been stolen from us. And what do you see as the biggest roadblock for you accomplishing what you want to accomplish? Is it just apathy and education or is there actually some sort of rules in place that, that, that make it hard for you? I mean, obviously, uh, I think there's been some preferential treatment to these big packing companies. I'm, you know, I'm sure they sure. use their, their, their market access and their, their money to steer things favorably. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike talks about the fact that they've been colluding together to fix prices and, you know that's that's obviously tough to compete with when you've got you know you've got people manipulating the market. But what are what are the what are the what are the hurdles that you face currently? The biggest hurdles that we face that we have overcome and is is the bottleneck of the processing centers. You know if we if we're if we are a nation that is relying on four multinational processing centers to process eighty percent of our beef, we're in some trouble. And so that is the biggest bottleneck and the biggest hurdle to overcome. The second is I've seen, and this is not a judgment, it's, you know, we're all guilty of it, but the complacency around, you know, the convenience of the supermarkets in that, that, that we actually believe, you know, that, hey, it has that stamp on it that, you know, that, then it's good. It's good for me that it's actually United States beef and it's not. So we have a multi-level as far as hurdles and uh, obstacles to overcome, once again, as my grandfather, what is the number one thing? Patience. Patience with intentionality, delayed gratification, and a lifestyle change. It actually, you know this, you see it every day. I don't I only know how many people that you've saved their lives by them just changing their lifestyle, changing the perceptions, changing the perspective. Quit validating the deceptions as far as the informational deception and basically the authoritative deceptions that got us here with the cholesterol lies, the fat-free fiction, everything that you know that we know that we battle. And so it's multi-front, it's multifaceted, but you, the individual, doesn't have to pay attention to it anymore. If you accept that you have been deceived or is there deception going on there? then acceptance is the key here. And there are no half measures. You get to the source of the seed of how we got here by our ancestors fighting and pioneering a food industry that made us powerful. And if you can accept that, then you can have intentionality to start from the ground up, do that vertical integration, understanding that true food comes from the from the soil to the grass to the cow to the rancher through the processing center to your fork, create that lifestyle to where you have that market access and your life will improve. More and more people are figuring that out. You and I, we're on the same team. We're doing this together today. More and more people are going to hear us. We're going to have a louder voice. And people are going to come along. People are hungry for this. They want authenticity again. And that's what we're giving. That's what you give every day. That's what I give within the Beef Initiative. That's why it's growing so quickly and very soundly. Yeah, I think the message that we get out there, you know, where we can collaborate is meat is medicine. And, you know, we consume it as a physician. I want people to be healthy as a producer. You're providing basically the medicine that that is that is keeping people healthy. And I hope, you know, it, it shocks me every time I lecture in front of cattlemen that they don't understand that they're producing a health food. Most of them still are under the hypnosis that meat is a bad thing. It's you know it's way it's a it's a, it's a source of living for them, and they've done it right. since they've done it for four or five generations. But they don't necessarily understand how much value they are providing to 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 the average person. And part of that is a you know and it, it always pains me when we see the attacks on all of, all the various ranchers about you know they're you know particularly coming from these plant based people with their nonsense about you know, torturing animals, which, you know, as you know, it's total garbage, regardless, yes. regardless of how the animal is, is finished, they're not being tortured by any stretch of the imagination. So it's a, it's definitely a, you know, it's definitely worth amplifying this message any way we can. 
All right, we've got a few minutes left, Tex. If somebody wants to support the beef initiative, if somebody wants to get some beef from you guys, how do they do it? You bet. I'll, I'll touch on a few points here. You know, I said we had a couple of uh, con- uh, summits, events, conferences this year. We're going to have a micro summit there in Nashville, and it's going to be the 8th and 9th. Uh, I would love to have you there. It, fly out to Nashville and come see us. I'd love for you to speak at that. That's an open invitation. Hopefully, all your followers are, will make you come. But uh, you have an open invitation. I want you there to talk about a lot of things that you do, okay? Mm-hmm. Brooke Miller is going to be there for the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. be there. Four or five of our ranchers are going to be there. Everybody else listening to this, if you can get to Nashville, come to that. If you want to source beef right now, go to the beefinitiative.com. Right there on the very first page, it says, buy your beef box right now. And it's the 8th and the 9th of December uh, is, is in Nashville. And if you go to the beefinitiative.com, you can look at future events. It says everything that we're doing there in Nashville. But don't hesitate. If you want to source your beef from here on out from somebody that you know, somebody that's trusted, you don't have to par- participate in the distractions, go to the beefinitiative.com. One of the biggest portals that got me here was my Substack. It was the newsletter. I wrote the Harvest of Deception. That's basically, I think, and when you found out, you know, that I was out here doing this. It's texasslim.substack.com. That's a very important thing. We're growing that to hundreds of thousands of people. People are coming in. That's a great form of information that you can really have market access to a lot of the things that I've talked about from the articles. We have guest writers. We have many podcasts that you can access through there. So it gives you a lot of good. It's a big umbrella of education if you want it. But like I said, if you want to get beef right now, go to go to the beefinitiative.com. And uh, I, I just relaunched my podcast. It's called I Am Texas Slim. And it's got over 70 podcasts in there. And it's texasslim.substack.com. And uh, that was just another question right there that came up. So those two things, texasslim.substack.com, beefinitiative.com. And if you go through, go get a beef box. And if, if, you, if you don't see something that you like, write to us. We want to hear back from what people need because we're open, we're open source right now. We, we are collaborating with the consumers saying, what is it that you're looking for? Do you want a box of 10 ribeye? Let's see if we can make it happen. You want a 20 pound you know, box of good, the best ground beef that you can get? We'll get it to you. So this is a collaboration. We are growing each day and we're not out here trying to compartmentalize you know, your consumerism or something like Whole Foods, Amazon, we are going to basically cater to the end user. And that's everybody that's really on this and everybody that you talk to every day. Same with me. Well, thanks for that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm considering, I, I know Brooke has asked me to come out to Nashville as well. And so maybe, maybe I'll see if I can, if I can swing it, I'll try to get out there, but um, we'll get out there. Cause Brooke's going to speak too. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Anyway, well, thanks. Uh, good luck with this. I hope the people will continue. To, I mean, we all need to support this. I mean, this is, this is, and thank you for doing this. And I mean, gosh, this is, we just need to take it back. And you're right. It's all, we do. it's on us. We can't rely on, you know, people say no one's coming to save you. You got to save yourselves. And, and this is how we do it. So well, we really do. Uh, and Sean, the thing about that is, you know, when people people feel like that that quiet desperation right now, there's that anxiety. You know, look at us. You know, everybody, you know, the prescription drugs and how, how food is used as a drug. Let's really, everybody out here, put your foot down. It's time. We've got people like Sean Baker. We've got people like me. We, we're doing this. We have proof of work and people are coming along. So I, I invite everybody, don't hesitate. And on that note, you know, this is going global. Sean, come with me to Australia too next <laughs> next February. <laughs> well, see, I, I think, I, well, guys, you mean February 2023 or 2024? Uh, 2023. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've got so many trips next year already scheduled. I know you, you but do. anyway, but I appreciate I to that. Throw that in there. I'm going to try to get to, I will try to get to Nashville, though. That's, that's a little okay, easier. I swing, appreciate so. that, Sean. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Texas, thanks for, Texas, thanks for doing this. And thanks for the, the Beef Initiative and, and taking the initiative to do this. This needs to be done. Anyway. It really does. Let's, you know, with anything, if your intentionality is to help save children's lives, we have a generation to save. We, we've we've uh, sold them short. They haven't had the break that we had growing up. So we're going to give it back to them. Good for you. All right, guys. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Take care now. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sean.